everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Language Lounge. My name is Michelle Ola, and today I'm going to be talking with Dr. Meredith Clark from Texas. And we all know if you've listened to the podcast at all, you know that there's a lot of great stuff happening in Texas. I've talked to Greta Lungard and Stephanie Sipes, and we've got Shelly Brown coming up and now Meredith. So I'm uh, very excited to talk to you about what you're doing in Texas in particular and how we can like spread this amazing innovation and uh, things that are happening across the country. So the first thing I wanted to say is our general theme is going to be, I liked how, how you worded this when we were going to talk and it's connecting professional learning curriculum and leadership through collaboration and community. And I'm afraid to say a lot of times when we hear professional learning curriculum and leadership, our first words in our mind are not collaboration and community, right? And I think that it's your goal to kind of change that, isn't it? <laughs> yes, 100%. 100%. We're, I love it. We're better when we're working together. I know that oh, sounds, absolutely. you know, kind of cliche, <laughs> but uh, it really is true. And, and I can't wait to talk to you about it. I love it. I love it. So Meredith, why don't you just start out and tell everybody kind of what your context is, what your what your role and what your kind of place in world language um, the profession is right now. Mm -hmm. Great. So I work at one of Texas's 20 education service centers. So essentially, most states have education service centers, but um, Texas is so big, it's divided into 20 different regions. And each region has an, an ESC or a service center and districts in that region call that service center for help with everything from child nutrition to managing grants to getting content uh, expertise and help. And so that's my job. I'm the master consultant for world languages and fine arts. <laughs> oh, support, wonderful. Yeah, I also support fine arts teachers. And so my job is to go out and help school districts and teachers with everything that you mentioned before. So curriculum, writing assessments, uh, professional learning, uh, modeling, instructional practices, and really as um my financial planner, Randy Black from Oklahoma says, I'm here to walk through life with you. Uh, oh, I love my, it. I see my role as I'm really here to walk through life with districts and be a long-term partner, someone they can trust and uh, use as a thinking partner to help them improve their world language programs. Oh, I love that. So everything from the district, the supervisors, the principals, all the way down to the individual teacher as well, or are you mostly... Um, in the larger scale? So <laughs> alpha and omega, right? We, you know, it's it's everybody because what I've been finding is going out, um, essentially the uh, requests for, for professional learning. Like, hey, will you come mm -hmm. out? Will you do a workshop on, on PD day? And as I started doing repeat requests with districts, I found out like, hey, you know, if we really want to make deep change here, we got to get everybody on board. So I work to uh, provide information for the district leader. Um, a lot of times, Region 10 is pretty big. We have 865,000 students and about 130 wow. school districts. Most of those school districts don't have a world languages supervisor. Um, they have either one person who's in charge of all the curriculum, or they have maybe like an English language arts person who's also doing world languages. So I provide information for them. I help them plan a strategy for their program goals. Also been working with campus administrators because, you know, they're like, I used to teach geology or, you know, um, I was the PE <laughs> right. teacher and now I'm supervising world language teachers. They're like, I don't speak French. You know, they pop their head in there and they're like, nobody's throwing a chair. Okay, check, the teacher's proficient. Um, so really like- yeah working all of the angles, right? You can't just focus on the teachers. We got to focus on the other pieces um, that are really important. So I get to work with everybody and I love it. That's fantastic. That That is great. And that also gives you a really broad perspective, I think. I, I think you can see things from many angles, from the teacher up, the, you know, kind of different um, points of view, which I think is always, uh, you know, a good thing. Uh, one of the things you mentioned and something we definitely want to talk about today is 
about moving the needle. And I know you've you kind of used that phrase. And so, so what is it that you want to move and how, what are you doing? You're doing some, I think, very interesting and innovative and really important things to try and move that needle. So talk about your kind of goal of what you're looking at with your professional learning. And you kind of hinted at it already. Great. Well, um, at some point in my career, I had a realization that it's like when we talk about what we're going to do for our world language programs, whether you're a district supervisor or a teacher, a lot of what we talk about is creating the thing and it becomes a checklist. So it's like, okay, we need to write curriculum. So check. Did we write the curriculum? Yes, we wrote the curriculum. Okay. Now we need to write the assessments. Check. Okay, we wrote the assessments. We need to do the professional learning and the book study. Check, check, check. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like sometimes, and, and this is just in our profession in general, in education, not necessarily only world mm-hmm. language education. But the question I have is, well, like, did we actually move the needle? And moving the needle, which was one of our first questions we had in our Texas Language Leaders Think Tank, which I'll say more about yeah. in just a moment was what does that mean? And if, are we just doing things or are we really moving the needle? And moving the needle means that we are um, getting all 5.4 million students in Texas proficient Mm -hmm. in at least another language, you know, than what they already came with. (laughs) So, you know, if we're not moving the needle and we're not checking to see are our students developing proficiency in another language, then we're just doing stuff. And it looks great on our resumes. Look at all the things we did. It's like, well, I read the book Influencer, right? Mm -hmm. Um, By Granny and I think there's like three other authors mentioned there. And one of the things that it says is a lot of times in nonprofits, we end up measuring the wrong thing. And so I I think about McDonald's, right? It's like a billion served. And it's like, well, was it nutritious? What, you know, did we move the needle? What were the outcomes? Right, right. Exactly, right. So so when I think about what we're doing in Texas, um, moving the needle to me means, did we, you know, develop proficiency for students? And one of the things that um, we're doing in the state is um, a think tank because I think we need to have uh, conversations about what moving the needle means and if we're doing it or not as a profession. And so this was kind of like this inner turmoil I had. It's just, oh my gosh, you know, how are we going to move the needle? And, you know, a lot of us just think in our little district or in, in our towns, but like, we got to start thinking together as a state. And so the idea for Texas language leaders, which is a, um, it's a think tank that's open to every world language person who's interested in the entire state. So K-12 higher education. We had the person who was working at the Texas education agency log on a few times. Um, it's really a space for everybody to come together so we can ask these questions that challenge our beliefs, examine some research out there, and then move us forward as a profession because we have a a different understanding of what it is that we're really trying to do. We keep that goal focused in mind and then we, we act to achieve that instead of just doing things because we're supposed to be doing it. Yeah. And often those things that we're doing are things that are told to us, right? Like whether it was told to us by the state, by the standards, by the whatever. Uh And again, even that, like we can just, well, did I have my standards listed? Yep. Do I have three modes of communication? Yep. Do I have X, Y, or Z? Um, And I, and I just, what I love about this think tank, and we're going to kind of talk about some of the things you talked about in it as well, is that it really is asking the questions and you know, nobody's coming in in a traditional professional development format, correct? I mean, that's my understanding, like giving these answers, like this is what we need to do to move the needle, which I think is what 
we hear all the time is what we need to do to do this. We need to do this. We need to do that. Right. And it's really, what do we need to do is the question. And then generating, and like you said, looking at some research and finding the most effective strategies and having conversations about it. Mm -hmm. Why are those conversations important? Why is it, why is, is starting with those conversations in that community? You might get to the same answer that somebody at the top yeah. says, yeah, yeah. but why is that important? So it's important because people need to be invited to the table. Um, we have lots of different ways that people participate in our profession. Uh, we have lots of different titles, right? So, you know, even within our state, we have the Texas Foreign Language Association, Um We have the Texas Association um, for Language Supervisors. We have someone who works at the Texas Education Agency. We have folks in higher education who are doing their thing. And so, you know, these conversations are so important because we all have the same goal and we, but we're all speaking different languages. And because of our titles, you know, we may or may not be involved or have access to certain pieces of information. Also, because of our geography, we also have in our state, like we have a Houston area mm-hmm. super, uh, teachers group. We have a San Antonio. We have a, a Metroplex <laughs> in the North Texas area. And those are for supervisors. And so it's like there's information out there, but there's a lot of people that don't fit into these categories, right, who maybe aren't even aware that TFLA exists, that's the Texas Foreign Language Association, or TALS, the the, uh, Organization for District Supervisors. So um, there's lots of people who don't fall under the umbrella of, hey, I can join this, or I don't live in Houston, or I don't live in San Antonio, Mm -hmm. I don't live in Region 10, so I don't have access to the same kind of resources. So these conversations are so important because everybody means everybody. And if we're going to move the needle, meaning that all 5.4 million students in this state develop a proficiency in at least two or more languages, we all have to be doing the work and we all have to be thinking and we all need to be invited to the table. I love that. And even the title, Texas Language Leaders Think Tank, right? So, um, that word that you chose to put in there is leaders. And yet, and you did say that leaders and everyone like that, this is not, yeah. there's not certain leaders and positional leaders or title leaders. This is for anyone that is at the table and wants to be there to move that needle. Right. And that was our first essential question for our think tank was who are Texas language leaders? Oh, I and, love that. And we threw out the question we get, we do like in our think tanks, we have about 10 minutes for networking and we put people in Zoom rooms so they can just meet each other and just kind of organically get to know people from all over the state. And then we throw out the question and we have, uh, traditionally we've used um, like a jam board or something like that, a place for people to collect their ideas. And, you know, people told us, um, you know, Texas language leaders are everybody. They're teachers, they're parents, they're district administrators. They're the people, they're the football coaches for crying out loud. I mean, what can football coaches do to support your world language program? Like anybody who has a vetted interest is a Texas language leader and we can all do something, even if it's a very small change to improve the situation and the proficiency outcomes for our students. I love that. And so what are, what's some of the feedback you're getting from participants and, and who's, who's showing up? Like, are you getting that wide range of experiences that you hope to get? Um, and what's the impact that you're seeing so far? Are you seeing an impact yet? Um, what kind of things, you know, what other things are you talking about? Tell us a little bit more about the, the specifics of, of these meetings. Sure. So, um, who's showing up? way more people than I thought. (laughs) That's wonderful. Yeah. We regularly have between, like I would say 60 and 30 people who Mm -hmm. attend. And um, I mean, there are people that I 
never met before. And, and I, I feel like I'm pretty plugged in, in terms of mm-hmm. I participated in T- TFLA. I continue to participate. I served on the board. I also am a member of the language supervisors group, um, did some work for Coral, our um, mm-hmm. language, uh, oh, NFL Research Center. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and, and folks attended Texas Language Leaders that I'd never met in any of those other organizations or our paths hadn't crossed before. Um, We have folks from really all over. Um, And because there are 19 other ESCs, right? So we're getting some of the ESC people, the Education Service Center people from other regions who are basically out there on their own. I mean, imagine being Mm -hmm. out there on your own in um, region 16, which is the Texas panhandle, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's like the Florida panhandle, very similar, very isolated in some ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting our education service center people to attend. Um, We're getting some folks from higher education. There's a teacher prep program right down the road. Um, and it was like, oh, you exist. Oh, we exist. All right, let's connect. So Dr. Cheryl Santos Hatchett has been coming. Um, Kelsey Kling from TEA, Texas Education Agency, has attended when she was able to. Um, and then just folks from school districts across the state. Um, so we've got, you know, East, South, um, you know, Gulf Coast, Central Area, Panhandle, so it's That's it's awesome. just really been cool to see people come out. Yeah. That that has to make an impact just yeah. on that, you know. One of the things I think that uh, because your meetings are Zoom uh Zoom, right? They're yes. virtual. Mm-hmm. And I think often about um you know the whole uh, you know the whole pandemic and everything that happened, but one of the good things I think that came out of it is this ability to connect people easier in a way that, you know, we can have meaningful conversations. And I mean, I I was doing virtual things before and it was not the same. It was, you know, me as a presenter talking to a room full of people. Mm -hmm. Um, But now that ability to be able to have these conversations and break out and, and really build a community, I think is, is a, a pandemic perk as, one of my friends, Kathleen Priceman, has said about for you know having to do with NEL, the National Network for Early Language Learning, is that that really allowed us to really connect and have deeper conversations, not just at a conference um, or something, and and open you know have more seats at the table, like you said, yeah. or invite more people into these conversations. Yeah, and um, and so, so many folks aren't able to travel; they they're not even able mm-hmm. to travel to the state conference just because of the cost. So mm-hmm. it's so nice to have. Uh, a way that we can connect um, that doesn't, that, that is completely free. And that's the other thing mm-hmm. about Texas language leaders is it's, not, first of all, it's not like a, a typical PD, you know, we always mm-hmm. open with a question. Some of the questions in the past that we've done are, you know, what, what does it mean to move the needle? What do we need to do to move the needle? Um, and um, in, in asking these questions, you know, and getting people involved from the other parts of the States. It's just been, it's just been a really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful experience. And it's free. It doesn't cost anything. Everyone's invited. There's, we want to remove barriers. I love that. I think that's so great. So you have a a community building aspect to this um, and a question that you discuss Mm -hmm. and talk about. Do you come away with action items as a group or individually as well? How do you spread that impact that you have during that meeting with that collaboration Mm -hmm. and then kind of reach out and do something about it. Can you, you, can you address that? Good. Thank you. That, you know, that's always kind of in the back of my mind and what keeps me up a little bit at night is I don't, (laughs) I don't want this to just be talking, right? Like getting together to talk Mm -hmm. about our profession is really cool and it's hip, you know, and, (laughs) but, but at the same time, like we need to do something So uh, one of the things that we did our first year was to create an action plan step. So to say, hey, what's one small action that you're going to take? Um, So we we had kind of like a master spreadsheet where people could enter in what they were going to do and send some updates. So we were able to see some updates through there. I I would love to say that 100 percent of the people participated and, you know, said they were going to take an action step and 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 
you know, told us that they, they did it and, you know, rainbows <laughs> opened up in the sky, you know? Um, sure. That's yeah. how it works. Yeah, right? of course. Every time. <laughs> um, but so, so we, but, you know, we had, I would say like a, a handful of uh, individuals who, who did, you know, consciously, you know, let us know these are the impacts, you know, this, these are the action steps that we are taking as a result of what we learned. Um, so that was one way that we were kind of tracking our own impact. Another mm -hmm. way is through, um, oh, this is so amazing. I had, so somebody I had never met before who was in brass of support, Tracy Thomas emailed me as a follow-up to one of the think tank sessions. And she was like, can we, just, let's just talk, you know? So we did a zoom and we were talking through things and by talking to Tracy, the idea for a leadership cohort came about because, you know, a, a lot of people call me and they're like, Hey, who can I call to bring in for PD? And I'm like, we have to be the people we call in to do the PD, mm -hmm. you know, like we need to be training people. Um, and because the, the PD one box, one and done trainer is not very effective. Yeah. We know. Mm -hmm. So what are other alternatives to PD can we do? And, and how can we start training people up across the state um, to start providing good professional learning? Like that's a skill, you know, um, adult learners are different from student learners. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. been a lot of research about how to do effective professional learning. So in talking with Tracy, this idea of, you know, we need to like shift the mindset on what it means to do professional learning instead of just, hey, who do I call? Right. Mm -hmm. And then start training people up around this idea of, you know, how do you lead change? Because really beyond professional learning, it's leading change, right, is really what we hope to achieve so that we can move the needle. So kind of like we did a mini Lil. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, That's Texas, awesome. But we called it the Texas. So language leaders, leadership cohort. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So Lil, again, if for those that don't know, is um, something that's sponsored by Actful, the leadership in language learning. Did I get uh -huh. them? I always get the L's in the wrong order sometimes. Right um, that is actually coming up again, I think for the next maybe cohort five, we might be on now um, as far as that goes. Um, but so that's a, a model of moving the needle in leadership and proficiency, um, both of those at the same time and bringing up those leaders across the, the country and then in our states and in our schools and in our districts and, and everywhere is the idea behind it. So mm -hmm. we'll put in the show notes some information to, to Actful's LIL um, program as well for those that want to know more. Yeah. But yeah, so you have a Texas leadership cohort then that kind of came out of some collaborative discussions that you wouldn't have even had with this particular person without this new sort of for format for, you know, collaborating, I think. Right, right. And so we had that's nine awesome. people participate in our first leadership cohort. Yay. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And, um, and they had action uh, items or projects that they did. And, you know, really, it was everything from arranging the first Texas Language Advocacy Day, which is on Monday. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, Perfect. Uh -huh. um, to um, we had one participant who her idea was to help get heritage learners to mm -hmm. a better spot so that they could move the needle faster, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, instead mm -hmm. of getting dumped into these, you know, level one, level two type classes that they didn't, that weren't meeting, meeting their mm -hmm. needs um, to, you know, we've had uh, leadership projects where um, the participants really could, they, they were in a coaching position or they were in a district supervising per, uh, position. So they've mm -hmm. led full scale projects where they have educated teachers on the standards, you know, and, and really planned to yield all of Granny's six uh, influence factors um, and to help make the change stick, right? So um, it, it's just been great to, to see their work. Um, uh, we had another participant focus on training their ESC staff. They moved from a district position to working at Region 13. And so uh, it's, it's just, I mean, the, you can see it. There's tangible evidence that um, 
things things are happening as a result of that learning. So that just that warms my heart. That's fantastic. That that is so great. So, what are some of the other t- um, topics that you've discussed? So, bes- besides just like the general um, topic of leadership and mm-hmm. kind of moving that needle, assessing where you want people to be, how to get there, you know, a lot of things. Um, what are some of the other topics, and what are some of the things that came out of this dis- this discussions on that topic? Great. So, um, our first year, we really focused on asking questions about. Who are the leaders? What is moving the needle? Um, how do we do that? Mm-hmm. For this, after that, you know, oh, and we have a uh, advisory team for Texas language leaders. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, from different organizations to increase buy-in. And, and so that's been really fun. So after the first year, the advisory team met and we, we talked through some things and it seemed like you know, we, we identified that effective, like in order to move the needle, we've got to have effective curriculum. We've got to have effective Mm -hmm. uh, teacher skill for instruction. We've got to have um, effective administrators who are supporting teachers, all of the things that we would traditionally Mm -hmm. say that are told to us, right? Mm -hmm. That's what what came out. And so um, after we identified those things, the advisory team, um, and we asked ourselves some hard questions. Um, it seemed natural that we should provide an exemplar for what some of these things look like. So, for example, if we say that in order to move the needle, we've got to have a standards aligned curriculum, what does that look like? Or and, and our standards are called TEKS for Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. So if you hear me say TEKS, that's what I'm So referring. TEKS, that's what, mm-hmm. perfect. Um, you know, what does a TEKS aligned unit look like? What does a performance assessment look like? Because we want to move from like j- talking about the profession to like, okay, here's some, here's some examples. What questions do we have about it? And, um, and, and, and what can we do with this, right? And so Texas is, is a bit unique. I'm sure there's some other states that are in a similar situation, but our uh, Texas Education Agency is not going to produce exemplars in terms of curriculum or units or assessments. Um, Texas is a local control state when it comes mm-hmm. to education. So each school district is, that's their job. That's the district's job. The state's job is to produce the standards and ask and answer questions, or excuse me, answer questions related to policy enforcement. So, mm-hmm. you know, we had to ask ourselves if the Texas Education Agency is not going to produce these exemplars like other state Department of Eds have done, um, mm-hmm. then should we as an organization do that? Do we have the power to do that? Nobody asked us to do this, you know, um, <laughs> is it a good idea? And we, we said, yes, it is a good idea because what's happening is a lot of folks in Texas are looking at exemplars from across the, the nation, which is wonderful. There's so many good exemplars out there and we thank people for sharing them. But essentially what happens is the state standards are not mentioned in other states exemplars. So we get folks coming back in and our state standards just kind of, you know, they're like, oh yeah, they're over there. Let's Mm -hmm. go ahead and write our curriculum. But when the campus administrator walks in and they're like, I don't see evidence of the state standard, like explicit evidence of the state standards being taught, then we're having this disconnect, you know? And so the idea for this year is to pr- is to collaborate to produce exemplars that are vetted by people, some of our top people mm-hmm. in the state who have volunteered to do this, and um, and show the state of Texas. Here's what a Texas, and, and I realize mm-hmm. that's going to sound kind of like Texas, right? but <laughs> here's a Texas <laughs> unit, right? That's aligned to yeah. our teaks, you know, um, mm-hmm. definitely informed by research and other exemplars um, that have come before us, but we want to give teachers an example of what their administrators 
should be hoping that they're doing. I guess. That's great. Yeah. And is that is that collaborative work of discussion of these exemplars, what's going to happen in the think tank? Is that part of that conversation then? So when we have the, so our think tanks, we, we, we throw out the question. I think our, our next think tank, which is next week, actually, a question is what makes an assessment excellent? Okay. And so we'll do some thinking about that. Oh, and one of the things um, that surprised me is that people actually asked for more time. Our, our initial think tanks were just one hour because mm-hmm. I didn't want to like Zoom fatigue people. And right, like, right we need more time, you know? So it's like, okay, we'll take more time. So we're going to take our time doing some networking in the beginning. And, um, and then we throw out the question, what makes an assessment excellent? And so we gather all of those ideas and then we're like, okay, here's an exemplar. Here's the physical object, tangible thing that it, it, it can look like, um, as aligned to our state standards. And so we're able to put that thinking with um, something concrete. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That some action, some something that then you can take and replicate and, and again, make that impact and move that. Needle. Yeah, 100%. Um, I love that. So you talk about assessments. What other things have you talked about? We've talked about units. So, okay, unit yeah. design. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What makes, uh, you know, what kind of unit will allow us to move the needle, right? Um, We're also gonna look at some example lessons, like what makes a very sound lesson, you know, lessons that, you know, make communication happen instead of just language practice, right? And actually allow us to move the needle. And our standards are wonderful. Our state standards were written with communication in mind. So, Really, I think in, in in the think tanks, people can see, oh, well, what I, I really want as a teacher is for the kids to be able to communicate. And the state standards really want the kids to communicate. The kids, even though they might not tell you, they really want to right. communicate. So, like, we're all aligned, you know, and it's it's just glorious to have that realization. I love that. That is so great. Um, and I think just, you know, one of the things that struck me that you said, and it's so true, if teachers, this is my opinion, but if teachers are in the right sort of professional learning situations, they do want more time. If you're sitting in a webinar where you're being talked at, yeah, an hour is plenty, right? And so um, we are, we're playing around with, um, not playing around, but with Wayside, we're doing some lead the way to proficiency series that are very similar to yours, where it's networking, it's communication, we do breakout rooms, and we mm-hmm. discuss questions. Um, and We've had the same sort of situation. We wanted to be respectful of teachers' time, keep it to an hour, and we're finding more and more. They're like, oh, oh but we, we didn't get a chance to talk to, you know, get enough, enough in depth. We didn't get a chance to do the action plan. We didn't get a chance to do these things. And so it is a wonderful thing. And you know that you're making an impact, I think, when, you know, you're you're seeing that sort of enthusiasm, right? And that sort of buy-in, which I don't think you'll ever really get from a webinar, yeah. you know, somebody talking at you sort of webinar and, mm-hmm. and not having that sort of communication. So yeah. I just, I just love that format that, that you're working on and that collaboration and that buy-in and just, you know, using that um, information. It's not just like you said, talking, you're not just getting people in the room to kind of go, oh yeah, we listened. We listened to people, you know, you're really having people have impact and input, I think is, is really great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's for everybody, you know, it's for everybody in the state. So even if folks, you know, we try to do it at a teacher friendly time, you know, because mm-hmm. um, a lot of things for leaders happen during the day when teachers can't attend. Yeah. And it's like, why are we doing this? You know, like, yeah. let's make it accessible and um, put some good resources out there that that really um, allow people to take what they've learned Um and and run with it um in in a you know a vetted way i mean we don't put anything mm-hmm. out that hasn't had their eyes on it like greta um and greta lungard and marita cleaver gave gave us feedback on our sample unit we had debbie callahan dingle um yeah. submit a lesson uh excuse me an example exemplar um so um 
you know, Shelly has been doing a leadership. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's all really coming together and we're working together in ways that we haven't in the past. And um, I, I think that we've added value, which is another, it's one thing that we really focused on in our leadership cohort is asking ourselves the question, how do we add value to world language education um, in a way that is, um, you know, consistent and effective, you know? Um, and so that that's our focus is to add value. It's not to just say that we did some webinars and people got PD credit, you know? Something out of it, right, yeah. A hundred percent. So let me ask you this. So let's say um, I'm a teacher listening to the podcast and I'm like, yeah, but that's great. That's Texas. That's, you know, Meredith is doing this with other, you know, people. What can I do? Like, what, what would you tell teachers that are not maybe in a state that is where they're able to participate in something like this? What are some takeaways that you hope listeners get out of this, um, what we talked about and what can they do maybe on in their kind of sphere of influence or their area um, that would be similar? Mm -hmm. Well, I would invite anybody who's interested to join our think tanks. Um, I think in the show notes, you can include the link um, for our webpage. Awesome. Um, anybody can. Even register. if we're not from Texas? Even if you're not from Texas and you're just curious wow, and you want to scope it out. Great. I mean, we're going to be talking about Texas standards, you know, and, and sure. like that. But um, if you're interested in, in just, you know, checking it out, see. Find it out how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you want to see it done. Wow. Come on. You know, everyone is invited <laughs> to the table. Um, and so, so that might be a first step, but I, I would also say, um, for folks who, who may not have access to that, um, create it. Um, if, you know, I think that's the, the most valuable thing that I got out of participating in Lil through Actful was number one, I never had a leadership title, so I never thought I was a leader until someone tapped me and said, you need to go to Lil. And I was like, what? Me? What? Mm -hmm. And and what I really learned from Lil was um, do it, be the change, create it. And so if you see the need to uh, collaborate with more people in your state or you, you want to break out of your small sphere and create a bigger sphere, if you're interested in challenging thinking, making sure that good information gets out to people, making sure that people have access to hear some of the best and brightest minds in the state, then create it, do it. Um, it but don't do it alone, right? Talk to some people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have the Texas Language Leaders Advisory Team um, and, you know, floated the idea. Is this a good idea? You know, what, you know, and, um, and, and, and you, you can create it, you know, and, but you don't have to create it by yourself. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think we can't always wait for somebody else to do it. Right. I right. think that's kind of what you're saying too. And impact to me, impact is impact, mm -hmm. whether it's impact in your school, whether it's impact in your district, your state, or national, when you're making an impact, you are making a difference. You are expanding that influence. You are, you know, doing it's, it's adding to that, um, that knowledge of, and that base of good teaching beyond your own classroom. Right. Mm -hmm. So anytime you do that, that's a good thing, in my opinion, whether you're doing it on social media, whether you're meeting on zoom with teachers in your district, mm -hmm. um, just to get together and talk about what, that end assessment should look like and having those conversations, right. right? And anytime you can collaborate and expand your community around these really important topics um, in our field, how can it not make an impact, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, and the, the, the change can be small. So if, if you're thinking, well, I, I can't create a state network um, mm -hmm. and manage zoom and all the topics and, you know, like that's just, I'm teaching full time. I have a family to take care of. Like, I can't do that. Um, it's not, I don't have the bandwidth. Um, that's okay. Um, but um, 
I learned something very valuable from a consultant who came to Region 10, um, Catrice Cate, and she, you know, talks about the, you know, one degree shift. And if you, Mm -hmm. you look at the flight of an airplane, if you have a one degree shift in the flight path, um, you know, from let's say Dallas to Lubbock, not going to be that big of a deal, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. you're still going to get to the Lubbock area (laughs) vicinity and you're Mm -hmm. not going to be that far off course, but over time, right? That one degree shift in thinking or action that you did makes a big difference the longer the journey. So even a small action can make a big difference. I'll give you an example. Um, Jennifer Terry, who was a teacher in our leadership cohort, her leadership project was initially to make a kind of flow chart for counselors in her district to help them identify the heritage students and get them into the correct classroom. Well, that sparked conversations with her central office curriculum director, and um, the project shifted a little bit to a different process. But look at what happened. Tiny shift, right? Tiny project. When you think about it, it wasn't that tiny. Right. But, I was mean, it, but still, yeah. It wasn't a statewide, you know, like right. think tank, you know. Um, but all of the students in, in that district are going to be impacted by yeah. the one action that she felt she could where she could add value on her campus. So it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing. It can be a very small targeted. That's another thing that we talk about, a targeted way to add value and it works. I love that. I love that. That is so great. That is a great um, example and a great um, sort of metaphor analogy, I guess, um, you know, to the impact that you can make uh, that there is no impact that's too small. right? Right. And so that's fantastic. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to to say before we kind of wrap it up. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, you too. Um, I will just say that um, (laughs) I'd like to consider that every student in the United States is an emerging bilingual. I think that when we shift our thinking to, hey, we're all going to learn at least one other language, right? Then, you know, and if we help the people around us shift their thinking too, um, and if we come together to discuss, talk, you know, figure out ways to add value, then, you know, we're really shifting the mindset and we're also backing it up with actions. So I I would just say that, um, Texas language leaders is just one way, one approach in order to to achieve that goal, which is really moving the needle and and getting all 5.4 million students proficient in at least two or more languages. And, And so whatever that looks like for people who, for our listeners, um, make it yours and, um, and just don't let go of the vision. Keep, yeah. Keep keep at it. Keep adding value, and um, people's lives will be impacted. And I know that we're going to see that. Um, what was it in America's Languages? The report that that bipartisan commissioned report that was published by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I think the statistic was is around twenty one percent of people report being bilingual in the United States. And I know that that we language educators. If we're adding value consistently in a targeted fashion to our programs, our students will develop proficiency and we're going to start to see that number change. And I can't wait until the next America's Languages report comes out because I bet we're going to see a different number. And and that's what I'm going for. Yeah, that's awesome. That gave me goosebumps. That's just very I think it's it it really. brings home to me the power of having a strong vision like that and having, yeah, that's a big goal. That is a big vision. And that's what kind of, we need to keep our eye on the prize, yeah. right? Keep our eye on that and then slowly whittle away at how do we get closer and closer and closer and closer yeah. to that vision. Yeah. Add I value love in a targeted way and we're going to get there, but I want people to hold those statistics in their heads, right? 
Yeah. Because that's how, how do we know if we're going to, if we've moved the needle? Well, there are more people we're gonna start who are seeing proficient, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's what yeah. we have to be assessing, right? So, um, and, and we can prove that we, you know, it's very easy to get data on that. Um, even if it's qualitative data or just informational data people are using with their school district in their rubrics, right? We can yeah. show that there's progress. And that's a really cool thing about doing professional learning with teachers is, you know, they come back and, and they're like, it works. Like my kids <laughs> can communicate in the target language. Now they're novices. It sounds awful, but they're doing it. And yeah. that's what we're going yeah. for. So it does work. We can prove it. Let's do it. I love it. There we go. That's that's a great way to end the podcast. Thank you so much, Meredith. It was a pleasure talking with you. Love hearing about everything that is going on. And I think this um, is inspiring to other people um, that are listening. And if you have questions, uh, can they reach out to you on social media? I know you're on LinkedIn and Twitter and probably all of the things. Uh-huh. And we'll awesome. Of course. Well, I hope I hope some people take you up on that and uh, we'll put all that information in the show notes. Thank you so much, Meredith. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much.